Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so thanks for the invitation to come and speak. So in, in the spirit that this is kind of some of these opening talks are a bit of a review, I thought I'd go back um, and start with one of the first papers that I know of anyway, which kind of discusses decadal climate variability a little bit. Um, this is uh, Kintzer from 1933, um, which has a whole series of long temperature records um, stretching from the 1890s up to, the, up to 1933. And it, um, it clearly shows there, is some, uh, there was a trend at the time, but also lots of, lots of variability as well. I mean, particularly in Greenwich, for example, you can see decadal variability. Um, this also highlights that <clears throat> the tropical regions on the right-hand side tend to have less noise uh, less variability, so uh, even at the time they knew that the tropics were less variable than the extropics, for example. Um, so we've also been simulating climate variability for a, a long time as well. This is from the first IPCC assessment report in 1990. Um, it's a personal communication. You probably wouldn't get away with that anymore. Um, this is one of the first GCMs, uh, control simulation, of the f one of the first GCMs in 1990, um, and you can very clearly see decadal variability in global mean temperature uh, in this very first one of the first GCM simulations. Now, what would be really nice if we could go back uh, and rerun this um, with range of forcing turned on rather than the control simulation. So we can do that. Um, this is what would happen, we think. Um, but I mean, this, this is trying to make the point that um, you can see uh, pauses, surges, all kinds of variability superimposed on top of a long-term trend. Um, and so, you know, it, Back then, we, we knew that we should expect to see periods of rapid warming and periods of slower warming. Um, <clears throat> how does all this relate to, to local scales? No, no one experiences global temperature directly. We experience it, um, temperature changes locally. Um, so if, this is one example, just showing global temperatures in red and central England temperature, where we have very good records stretching back a long way in black. Um, obviously, central England has a lot more noise. Um, we you know, very variable weather in the, in the UK. Um, but you can still see the fingerprint of the global temperatures on the UK temperatures. You can see the familiar warming during the, from the early 20th century. You can see the cooling uh, or flat period during the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then a rapid warming at the end. So you can see that fingerprint of global temperatures on a local scale. And you can see by the, the correlations listed in the, on the top here, as soon as you start smoothing the data a little bit, the correlations are extremely high. So that's for temperature. That's not true for rainfall for example. So if it's, say, summer rainfall, which is something we might want to be able to predict, is far less correlated with global temperatures than temperature, as you might expect. So the correlations here are basically zero. There is, you know, you, you might say there's something on multi-decadal timescales, but it's much, much weaker than for temperature. So global temperature doesn't tell us everything. There's a lot of variability on regional scales. Um, just continue the history a little bit. Um, one of the first studies, I think, um, that I found anyway, which discusses how variability might affect um, future trends. For example, this is from um, a Clivar document. So Clivar's been thinking about this for a very long time. Clivar exchanges in 2001, um, Sutton and colleagues. Um, so the observations are in white at the time, and they ran sort of what we, you know, this, this is a small ensemble, but um, at the time it was a large ensemble of three um, simulations for the, next, the following 20 years or so, showing that there was a, a long-term trend, but interacted with variability as well to, to, sh to show that you would get very different trajectories uh, possible in the future. And this is kind of what motivated, I think, a lot of the decadal prediction work, this, this type of activity um, back in the early 2000s. Of course, now we can run much larger ensembles. So this is one example from Clara Dessa's work uh, with the CCSM large ensemble um, over Europe again. Um, so um, most of us are probably quite familiar with this work, but they've run a very large 40-member ensemble uh, forward from uh, a modern time. Uh, and f so they, for example, this is European summer temperatures. This is the, the top left shows the average uh, trend over 55 years uh, in this large 40 member ensemble. So that's the mean. Um, but if you look at the individual simulations, you can see uh, a warmest and a coolest simulation showing a very, very different temperature pattern of trend. So this is, the, this is a 55 year trend. You can see very, very large differences in what might happen. Now, th these ensemble members were all started from the same initial condition, just with small perturbations to the atmosphere. So this essentially is the butterfly effect, the chaos, um, causing these divergence in, in the simulations. That's quite a large change um, just, just from that small perturbation um, in the initial conditions. Just so to highlight that a little bit more, there are the time series from certain points in this ensemble. 
the red line shows the warmest member and the blue line shows the coldest member. Um, and you can see there's you know, quite a dramatic difference between the different ensemble members just with the small perturbation to initial conditions. So, for example, Paris or France or Oslo, uh, the example shown here, you can see very, very different 55-year trends, whereas for the global temp temperature trend on the bottom, um, they're much closer together, but not identical. So um, this sort of raises a lot of questions. You know, is, is this true in other models? This is, this is one model they did this in. Um, you know, is, is the variability in this model realistic? Would this happen in other models? Um, what happens if you perturb the ocean in initial conditions as well as the atmosphere? So um, we decided to test some of this in quite a bit uh, of an idealized situation. Um, we use the famous uh, global climate model, which is a very coarse model, which means it's very fast, which means we can run lots and lots and lots of ensemble members very quickly. So we did a more idealized situation. We did a 1% per year increase in carbon dioxide for 140 years. Um, and we have a long control run. Um, and we picked at random one particular initial condition from that control run uh, and ran 100 members uh, initialized, again, with a very tiny perturbation to identical initial conditions. Uh, and you can see the ensemble here are, are for the European winter temperatures as one example uh, on the top right. And again, you can see the, the differences in trends um, are extraordinary. You know, there's, there's one simulation there which shows a very rapid warming, another one which shows a very rapid cooling over 30 years. And the bottom right shows a histogram of the trends, of 30-year trends. Um, again, you can see members with a strong cooling and members with a strong warming, but there's, there's a very, very wide range. So to explore what the ocean does, we also ran what we call a macro ensemble, where we took 30 different members from 30 different coupled initial conditions, well separated in the control run, to try and understand what effect that would have. So you might imagine, of course, that if you um, build in more uncertainty initial conditions, then you're going to amplify the spread even more, um, and that's what we see. So again, we have the same two diagrams as I've just had before for European winter 30-year trends. Um, the, the top right shows the time series, the middle right shows the micro histogram, and the bottom shows the macro histogram where you're just taking into account the ocean initial conditions. The spread is a lot bigger, but also the mean is very different. Um, in the macro case, you're seeing a lot more warmer members than you are in the micro case. So it turns out that in our in our random selection of our micro case, we happen to pick a particularly unusual situation, um, and I'll come on to that in a moment. So if we now look at, again, these average, in the same way that Clara showed in her work, the average trends. So you can see the left column shows the micro ensemble, and the middle column shows the macro ensemble. In the micro ensemble, you actually see an average cooling over some parts of Western Europe, whereas you don't see that in the macro case, which samples the ocean initial conditions. Um, and if you look at the maximum and minimum ensemble, trend, ensemble members, again, you can see almost any, any trend you like, you know, from plus three degrees to minus three degrees over 50 years. Um, and that's the individual members. You can also look at what happens if you select each grid point independently. And again, that again saturates um, the color scale, and you can essentially get any result you like just from perturbing the initial conditions very slightly. Um, so what happens with rainfall, you can also do this with rainfall, and again, you can see a very strong wetting um, or a very strong drying, depending on the ensemble member you look at. So what, what's going on in this particular ensemble? Um, so we've now look at the time series of European winter temperatures, and you compare the two ensembles. Um, the micro ensemble is doing something a little bit strange, whereas the macro ensemble is, as you might expect, just a more linear warming, because it's a straight 1% per year increase in CO2. Um, so what's causing this effect in micro? There's obviously some predictability and some memory here in the inertia initial conditions. Um, so it turns out that in this particular ensemble member that we, or the ocean state that we picked, the AMOC was in a particularly predictable state, for example. So all of the ensemble members had a very strong strengthening of the AMOC followed by quite a strong weakening of the AMOC. And so you can see that reflected in the European temperatures. And so there's obviously some predictability here, but it's obviously going to be important to sample the ocean initial conditions when you're designing these ensembles as well as just perturbing the atmosphere. Um, so just uh, one final example of what, that, what effect that has. If we look at the probability of a cooling trend over the first 20 years of the simulations, um, when, we're, when we're accounting for the ocean initial condition uh, uncertainty, we see quite a sort of a, a, a broad blue color, light blue color over much of the, much of the world, extropics. Um, whereas in the micro case, which is this very specific ocean initial condition, we see a very strong probability of a cooling over certain regions in the Southern Ocean uh, and the North Atlantic. 
So again, this just highlights the differences between these ensembles and the need to sample different ocean states. And as you go further ahead in time, you can see they do get, gradually get closer together and there's less chance of seeing a cooling trend, um, but it takes you know, 50 years for these patterns to converge. Um, and one, one little other example, if you, you can also, in this very large ensemble, we have lots and lots of members, we can find um, lots of members which have zero trend over, say, a 15-year period, even when, the, even when the CO2 is increasing. So all of these four different members have exactly zero trend over 15 years, um, and these are the trends spatially over those 15 years, and you can see that the patterns are, well, you, know, you can see actually the first two there are almost exactly opposite. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of different types of um, variability trends which can offset the warming um, in this particular model. I should say this particular model ha does have a slightly enthusiastic variability. The variability is probably slightly too high compared to the real world, but you know, the, the, the principle is there that you know, there, there do seem to be lots of different types of hiatus possible in this model, and I think that would be interesting to explore a little bit more. Um, as, how, how does global temperature go in this particular model? So this is the histogram of all the possible trends in global temperature over, over 15 year periods, and 1.2% of them have a cooling trend, for example. Um, if you then subsample the 15 year trends following those 1% that are cool, so that we, we take the 1% of members which show a cooling trend for 15 years, and look what happens in the following 15 years, um, we see the distribution is shifted slightly to the right. So, you might expect this to happen. This is kind of regression to the mean, if you like. After there's been a pause, you actually see a more high, higher chance of a surge um, in the following 15 years. That's maybe not a surprise. Uh, and I'm going to finally finish with the point that the, um, Gavin brought up this, this study a little bit earlier on. Um, and it's a different topic slightly. It comes down to how we compare our models and our observations. So, uh, the top panel shows quite a sort of familiar type of diagram comparing the observations of global mean temperature with the CMIT-5 ensemble. And say so the, the recent period you see that the observations at the lower end um, of the ensemble range. The red line shows the normal uh, projections from the CMIT-5 ensemble and the top panel, just looking at the top panel to start with. Um, but of course when we're comparing the observations, we're not comparing apples with apples because in the observations, uh, we are using air temperatures over land, but we're using SSTs, so sea surface temperatures over the ocean, and it turns out that the SSTs warm slightly slower than the air temperatures. Where in the models, we're just sampling air temperature everywhere. And so this small effect actually makes quite a, well, it makes a difference to this comparison. So that's the difference between the red line and the blue line. So because, <clears throat> um, so then if we treat the models as observations and subsample um, from the, uh, simulations where we have observations and the same, and we account for the observation type. So we blend the SS simulated sea surface temperatures with the simulated air temperatures over land. Um, it makes a difference and it nudges down the models from the red line to the blue line. If you then account for the updated forcings that Gavin described earlier as well, the same comparison in the bottom panel. So that, as Gavin said, if you update the forcings, it nudges down the models towards the, towards the observations. Um, and now if you look at the blue line in the bottom panel, which accounts for the updated forcings that, that Gavin talked about, and this um, using blended temperatures with the, the simulated temperatures of the ocean and the S80s of the land, you see that the blue line is now much, much closer to the observations. And so it turns out this, how we do this comparison is actually extremely subtle, some of the details that have how we do this. So, you know, we have to account for the variability, we have to account for the forcings, we have to account for the fact that we don't observe everywhere, and we're not necessarily comparing like with like all the time. Um, so, in summary, uh, the climate and our simulated climate certainly exhibits substantial natural variability in temperature, rainfall, uh, also sea ice, I haven't talked about that, but that's also true. Um, our models show a very large diversity in these characteristics, Rowan uh, described that briefly earlier as well, uh, and we need to better understand those differences if we're to you know, robustly attribute what's going on in the observations. Um, these large ensembles, which more and more groups are running now, are very valuable tools to explore possible outcomes on regional scales. We need to think about how we communicate and visualize um, these, this variability as well. You know, we need to communicate to the fact that, to the public, that we don't necessarily expect temperatures to go up all of the time. Um, and we do need to be very careful when we perform these comparisons of models and observations that we're comparing like with like. Um, otherwise, you might, you, might make, you might come to the wrong conclusion. 
Uh, there's also a poster discussing, in this similar topic, discussing the sensitivity to reference periods, which is also, uh, again, quite subtle, but also quite interesting. Thank you.